Welcome to Lit with Lloyd. I am your host, Lloyd Russell. And tonight we have as our guest, Trammy Wynn Cron, uh, who has written uh, a book that I loved. Uh, and she's going to tell us about a second book that she now has. Uh, so welcome to uh, the podcast. We're just thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much, Lord, for having me. I'm excited to be here again. Yes. <laughs> um, we had uh, Trammy at our book club uh, a little over four years ago, uh, and uh, she was a big success there, and uh, she's got some, uh, some great things to tell us. So let me start by asking you how you came to be in Northern California. Wow, that's a long story. Of course, it's about a boy. <laughs> Isn't it always about a boy? Um, I actually, after college, I grew up in Utah. After college, I uh, started to work in Southern California. And because of a boy, I decided to move up north. And here I am. <laughs> and no, I'm not with a boy anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I want to start by uh, by actually talking about your book, uh, Vietnam Easy, a novel about mothers, daughters, and food. Uh, tell us how you came up with this idea uh, and how it came to happen. Sure. Um, you know, I've, I feel like I've always had these stories inside me because of what my grandmother and what my mom have shared with me a lot about the Vietnamese culture growing up and the stories that I heard from them. I've never seen in movies or read in books in America. I was born in Vietnam. I came to the U.S. when I was 11 years old. I lived in France first, then came to the U.S. And um, it was really missing. I, I feel like there's this part of the Vietnamese culture or Asian culture that's not mainstream America. And I wanted to share those stories. So of course, the book is not based on anyone real or whatever that phrase is. Um, <laughs> you know, make sure that I don't get sued here. Uh, but I, that's really the, the intention. I wanted to share my culture with the American audience. All right. Can you uh, hold up the book so we can see the cover? Sure. Here you go. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Tell us, uh, tell us how the book is constructed. I know you have recipes and, and stories to go with those. How did you come up with all that? Sure, I wanted to share the stories in a really non-threatening way. And food is something we can all connect to. And living um, in Little Saigon, in San Jose, um, even if you don't live here, you know you come to San Jose to eat all these different um, variety of food. So in Little Saigon, we have like thousands of restaurants. So I figured, you know, I'm going to approach it in this very non-threatening way by introducing every single chapter with a theme and the theme follows a recipe. So for example, um, one chapter has catfish in a clay pot and clay pots are like dark, right? So that's the dark chapter, if you will. <laughs> so every chapter has its, um, you know, is this a happy chapter? Is this a reminiscing type chapter? So that's how I constructed um, each chapter. And essentially it's a, um, the character goes through, try out for a food network show. And um, she, everything that she cooks is from her family recipe and the stories that her mom or her, her grandmother would tell her as she cooks these um, recipes, she would remember them. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, so each story is basically about the same central character. Yes. Uh, and what she goes through. Uh, does the book uh, include her show, being on the show? Yes, so it's present day, being on the show, and then remembering her grandmother's life story, and then her mom's life story, and then her own. And so it's all woven in from historical Vietnam uh, to present day. So it's, it takes you back and forth a little bit, but it, the way it's structured is very easy to follow. With all the different recipes that you could come up with, do you see another book that would be a similar format with more recipes and maybe a different story? <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, when I started the recipes, I also realized that it was also, okay, I have a background in marketing. It was a great way for me to connect with other um, local 
leaders or restaurateurs. And so each recipe ended up being uh, from a local restaurant. And unfortunately, with the whole 2020 COVID and everything, many of the restaurants are no longer. Uh, Isn't that sad? It is indeed. Um, and so only a few of the recipes are actually my own. So like the crab recipe. Um, uh, we also borrowed that from Straits. So Straits is still around on Santana Row. Um, it was a collaboration between us to create that recipe. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, 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 you did. <laughs> oh, well, the, the each chapter, do I see another one? Well, um, there is another book that I published, we can talk about later, it's called Art Venture Down the Mekong. We will get to that. Right, but also eight chapters eight different things that um, will will entice the audience, maybe not through food, but through art and culture. So that's usually my approach, I guess. I'm seeing a pattern here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, can you prepare all eight recipes from uh, Vietnam Easy? Absolutely. They, they're <laughs> tested, tried and true, you know, from, the, from different chefs, so. Uh, how long did it take you to write the book? It actually only took me about a year and a half, which as I understand in the literary world, it's, it's pretty fast. <laughs> yes. For me, it was like, this took too long. <laughs> but I think because the stories were in me, it was easy for them to just flow out. How has your book been received first in the Vietnamese community and then just out there? Interestingly enough, um, the Vietnamese community did not really um, receive the book all that much because I did not write it for them, right? Uh, I wrote it for the American audience. And so most of the, the strategy and marketing it and promoting it really went to the mainstream. Um, for the ones who do know about it, they are the ones that grew up here. So it, it resonates with them a lot because that's the struggle. I'm a second gen, well, I'm a 1.5 generation Vietnamese. <laughs> so born in Vietnam, but mostly grew up in America. Yeah. So there's a lot of us out there that feel lost. We're not quite connected to our culture, but we're not quite full on white America either. So we're like the in-betweeners. And so for, for them, I think it's well received. Yeah, uh, so it did not sell in Vietnam. Was that even part of the marketing effort? No, because it's in English, right? The book's in English, it's not translated. It was not translated. Yes, and it's really, again, is for the American audience yeah. when I wrote it. Uh, and has it been well received by the American audience? I think so. I mean, I've I've been invited to quite a few of these, you know, talk shows and, and being highlighted. So it's been a, a really exciting journey. Um, but I really feel like it opened doors for me to do other things. Uh -huh. So sometimes, you know, we're destined to do something and this is just a stepping stone. That's what I feel the book Vietnamese is, is for me. How did you come up with the name? Well, it was so the, the main character goes uh, to create a, a cooking show and it's called Vietnamese, made with easy <laughs> American ingredients to make Vietnamese food, right? So it, that's how I came up with the name and it's spelled Vietnam, E-A-Z-Y and not S-Y uh -huh. because you are, the URL Vietnamese S-Y was already taken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, th there are probably hundreds or thousands of titles that were changed from what the author originally wanted it to be right. <laughs> <laughs> for these kinds of reasons. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, tell us about the publishing process. I would have to say I was very blessed. Um, you know, I, I was like targeting the New York agent and, and all that, but I was guided um, with a, actually a, a a famous author who lived in Santa Cruz, that's where I lived and wrote the book at the time, and um, his name is Steve Ketman, who decided to create his own publishing company uh. called Wellstone Books in Santa Cruz. So he was, he guided me through it and he said, you know what, we're gonna publish it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yes, Wellstone Books in Santa Cruz, they published it. And, and are they still yes. doing okay? Absolutely, and there's a beautiful center um, in Santa Cruz Mountains where they invite writers to come and retreat there. It's called the Wellstone Center. Um, so you could check it out, it's on, online. It's a beautiful place. Okay, yeah. uh, let me just throw this out at you. Uh, you were blessed, but it wouldn't have happened if it, the book hadn't been worthwhile. <laughs> That's right. Because nobody is going to publish uh, something that is not going to sell. <laughs> uh, and, I, and as I said, we really liked it. Uh, 
One thing I want to refer back to when you came to our book club, there were two women there who told a story about how they barely got out of South Vietnam before North Vietnam took it over. Mm. Uh, it was a fascinating story. Have you heard a lot of stories like that? Uh, did your did your own family have to deal with that? Well, our family was not lucky. We actually got left behind. Mm. So my father, my birth father, he did go on one of those helicopters that you see on TV at the embassy, you know, at the fall of Saigon. He was one of the lucky few that made it. But the rest of my family, meaning my mother, my my brother, and my maternal grandmother, you know, family, we stayed behind. So we lived with the communists until 1981. Wow. So yes, it was quite a trying time, if you can imagine. Um, I was only, what, two or three um, when it happened. And I still recall the chaos. I still recall my grandmother flushing Vietnam dong money down the toilet and it's the squatting kind even though we lived in the city but that's just the way it is y'all okay <laughs> you they put it down the toilet and she was using the back of a broomstick to stick it down there and flush water wow. because you cannot have that kind of money because then they'll think that you're taking money from the people that's the claim right because we're all supposed to be equal so I remember that type of trauma how did you get out so luckily we had a lot of family in France already. Uh. And so they were able to sponsor us to go to France. So kind of funny, we're refugees in France, but we're immigrants in America. So the distinction, when you're a refugee, the government takes care of you, right? Uh. When you're an immigrant, you have to have a sponsor that will take care of you or you take care of yourself. So in France, the French government took care of us. Coming to America was a choice that my family made. And because my father was already living in California, um, he was able to get us papers to come to California. And um, yeah, so I'm an immigrant, <laughs> very different status. So not all Vietnamese people are refugees. How long did, did it, how long was it between the time your father got here and you got here? So uh, he got here in 75 and I got here in 83. Wow. So I do not know my father in that way, in the traditional way. Yeah. Um, I feel like the Vietnam War, which I hope we don't end up talking about because I feel like that's why I wrote the book is all we do is talk about the war, right? Let's talk about the culture. But the war has left marks not only just on the soldiers, obviously, but also on the children for generations to come, right? So if me without a father, if I were to have children, I don't have any children, but other people do, they will raise children differently because they didn't grow up with a father, right? And so this affects all of us, generations to come. So when it comes to war, for me, it's, you know, it, it's never ending. One war never truly ends. Yeah. Well, I was fortunate. Uh, I didn't get a good draft number when the lottery came <laughs> out, but I did join the reserves. Mm -hmm. And that's how I didn't have to worry about going overseas. Uh, uh, and I also went to Cal Berkeley in the late 60s. So you can imagine what kind of upheaval was going on sure. on the campus all during the time I was there. Yeah, well, I'm uh, grateful you didn't have to go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I, I definitely wanna find out and talk to you about some of the other things that you're doing and where this has all led you, but you've got a new book. So talk to us about the book and, and maybe you can hold it up for everybody to see. Sure, so it is called Art Venture Down the Mekong. It is an easy to make art projects book. There are eight chapters in the book. Each chapter we introduce a culture along the Mekong Delta. And then we introduce a, an art lesson that our local artists created uh, around that culture. So for example, Myanmar, uh, what they're famous for are these um, umbrellas or uh, they're called THTI. And they're famous for that. So we help the you know participants or people who buy the book learn how to make these little umbrellas based on the traditions. But of course, very easy to make. <laughs> yeah. Um, with really cheap art supplies. And the book is also translated into Vietnamese. Ah. Yeah, that was important to us because it was created during the pandemic when shelter in place happened. 
and those of us who are lucky enough, we have social media, we can access, you know, Zoom and whatnot. But for our Vietnamese elders, they could not do that. So we created this book for them, as well as the American general audience, you know, and kids. So yeah. the book's for eight to 80 year olds. Yeah, and it, easy, um, cheap m materials that you can just find anywhere and you can make all these wonderful art books and uh, art um, projects and also learn about the cultures. All right, we're going to take a quick break, uh, and then we'll be right back to talk a lot more uh, with Trammy. Thank you to the Los Gatos Community Foundation for their continued support of KCAT Public Media. Because of groups like the Los Gatos Community Foundation, KCAT has been able to inspire, educate, entertain, and inform our community through the magic of television and digital media for over 38 years. Thank you. Okay, and we are back. Uh, there's a question that I really would like to ask you that, that it, it's kind of a confusing thing for me. And having been born here, of course, I don't really know how that works. You are a U.S. citizen, correct? Yes. But you still call yourself an immigrant. Why? How does that work? I guess I have always been othered. Let's let's tell the truth here, right? I. It's also a flaw, a flaw in not only the um, white American psyche, but also the Asian American psyche. So as far as the Vietnamese who came here, we when we say Americans, to us it means white people, right? Um, it doesn't include all the Asians and all the, you know, Middle Easterns, like all, everyone, it doesn't. And I guess because of, that's how I feel inside, that's how I express, that's, those are the terms that I use. Um, in terms of status, I guess the government will always you know, on paper, I am an immigrant to the U.S. and I became naturalized to become a U.S. citizen. So I was not a born, you know, person yeah. in America. But I, 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 I need to change that. Uh, thank you for pointing it out. I think I need to change the way I address when I say this is for the general American audience. It should, and and then I. You're making me think. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. I think it's really good to to point that out and there's a something that's unsettled about it in me and maybe that's why I express it that way. I would like I would love to feel like I belong. Do I feel like I belong? No. Not yet. Wow. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, I will tell you that that if if you get back to me with any kind of information along those lines I'll make sure to to add that into a podcast and, you know, and into a future podcast so that, you know, all the people that have heard this one can get an update on on how you're approaching it, maybe a little bit differently. Uh, and the other thing that is is very difficult to talk about, but, you know, there has been a, a certainly a large increase in 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 physical discrimination against uh, the Asian community. Uh, do you know people that have, have been subject to that? Have you experienced anything along those lines? I have not experienced mm -hmm. anything. I think maybe because I live in San Jose and we are very lucky here. It's a very diverse community um, in this area. I do know about friends whose parents have been victimized. So I mm -hmm. think they're targeting the elderly because it's harder for them to, you know, defend, to themselves. defend themselves. Um, but... I have fear now that I didn't before. So one day my dad from, my stepdad from um, Utah came to visit with my mom and we were inside the restaurant and, he, and we're waiting to pay the bill. So he decided to go outside, this is downtown San Jose, to go outside just to stand, look around. And immediately my thought was like, he's gonna get hurt, you know? Like that's, wow, that's what that's came to mindset. my mind, yes. When it was never an issue before. Yeah. So I kept my eye out for him and yeah. And uh, yeah. That sucks. It's really sad. Oh, it really yeah. is. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. That, that shouldn't be happening. Um, Thank you. All right, well, 
uh, we'll, we'll turn to things that maybe are a bit more pleasant. If that's, if <laughs> but that's, that's okay. life, and that's why I love your show because it's not about fluff. This is life, you know, and I, I think it's wonderful that you're pro providing a platform for us to share what really bothers us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 basis for the show is is interviewing authors uh, <laughs> but we want to find out about you know what what goes on and and about your lives uh, so thank you for being so open about that um, so tell us now about other projects that you're working on uh, I believe that you're quite busy with a lot of different things yes um, so I'm the founder and executive artistic director for Chopsticks Alley um, Chopsticks Alley has a website where we do our publication podcast, all the fun stories about Vietnamese and Filipino Americans, but also a nonprofit, which is based in art and culture. So we share the Southeast Asian art and culture with the general audience. <laughs> and um, we promote Southeast Asian artists and it's super fun. And that's where the art venture down the Mekong book came from. All of the artists here are local and they're from um, an Asian background. And yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. We've had that since 2018 and we're just like taking the whole arts, you know, industry by storm right oh, now. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's so great. But you're also very involved in food. Yes, I love to eat and cook food. <laughs> <laughs> isn't Chopsticks Alley though, isn't there some kind of a, a food piece of it? Yes, it actually started because of my book, Vietnamese. I started ah. a food group called Chopsticks Alley. And from that, we realized that the Vietnamese young American voice was not being heard. So we start the chopsticksalley.com website and the name kind of stuck. That's what people liked. So they, they wanted to stay with the name. They didn't want a new, you know, cause I was gonna call it Vietnam Current or some other name. <laughs> and so when the art um, happened, it was just a natural thing. We're just continuing with the, the name. It's branding, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that certainly is. Uh, what kind of group do you have that you, that works with you? I mean, do you have a lot of people or just a couple? How does it work? Yeah, we have a lot of wonderful community partners like the San Jose Museum of Art, mm. um, the School of Mexican Art and Culture, uh, Starting Arts. I mean, so many wonderful arts group that really lifted us and help us move along. And I think without these really important partnerships, we wouldn't be where we are today. And of course, the city of San Jose and the California Arts Council also sponsor a lot of wow. our projects. Yeah, and wow. foundations too. So it's been <laughs> a really fun ride. Is it something that is either national or can be national or international? Well, I think that because of the COVID thing, we ended up doing a lot of programs virtually. And we had people participating from Hong Kong, <laughs> wow. you know, so I, I guess, you know, uh, these the, the Zoom thing could be not so fun at first. Like we were pretty resistant like everyone else and we're realizing, oh, it's this platform that could take us elsewhere. But really our heart is in Silicon Valley. We want to serve the people here because there's so many underserved families that need art and pro in, in their lives, right? Well, I think there's going to be a very good possibility of you being able to uh, take your art project and your book and uh, use it uh, uh, out in the community. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. I have been doing that and can't wait to do more. That's great. Um, okay, I wanna, I wanna re return to Vietnam Easy for a little bit. You said it took about a year and a half to write. What what made you write it, and 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 how did you get help? Did you have uh, did you have early readers? Did you have uh, editors? Um, obviously, your your publisher helped you uh, get it ready for publication. But how about before that? Well, you know, this is funny. So English is my third language, and I took those. Um, you know, comp comprehensive tests or whatever. And I really was really bad with reading comprehension. So I pretty much thought of myself, I can't read, write, whatever, right? So I, I focus on math, I was a really good math student. <laughs> Until one day I wrote a letter to uh, my brother who he came way earlier than me. And he said, you know, you're a really good writer. And it stuck, it stuck because I thought, well, one, he's my brother, he's supposed to. Um, <laughs> the other thing is I thought, well, maybe there's something there. 
Um, then I got to go to Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. I was on a scholarship. I was a poor student there, you know. Everyone had like Louis Vuittons and the king of whatever son was going to school there. Um, and everyone was taking fun classes, art classes, oceanography, whatever. I was taking writing classes. Huh. Thinking back now, I guess it was a good thing. But on the other hand, I'm like, well, you know, I should have had some fun. I took myself very seriously back then. Um, so long story short, I had some help from, of course, uh, Steve Ketman. And then he hired like editors and all that. But I think the, the writing just came. It, it really, truly did. Um, and I guess it's there's something in me that I was able to do that despite not speaking English well or thinking that I should never write because I couldn't understand. And, and really, I couldn't because I didn't speak English, right? <laughs> but I didn't think that. As a kid, you, you, you read those tests and you're like, oh, my score is really bad. I, I must suck at that. You know, can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> I used that earlier. Okay, so, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so kids don't give up, you know, and um, you have a lot in you and don't, those tests are meaningless. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Um, okay, well, I mean, it's, first of all, your English is beautiful. Okay. Uh, uh, you obviously, since it's a third language, you obviously see, speak French. Yes. <laughs> Fluently. <laughs> yes. Uh, have you had occasion to go back to France as Absolutely. an adult? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, my grandmother and my uncles, they all stayed there. So I get to go no, typically every other year, the COVID blah, blah, but I am going this <laughs> March. Yeah, it's been quite a few years to wow. see her. She's like 90 something, we oh stopped my counting. Gosh. Yeah. So very excited to go again. And each time I go, it takes a while, a few days for me to en français again, you know. <laughs> uh, is your is your grandmother in pretty good shape? She is. She for she's uh, her mind is totally sharp. So that's that's the best thing. <laughs> um, I, I, we have a friend. Uh, her mother is 106. Wow. Lives by herself. You know they have help come in, but uh, she's of sound mind. And and for those of us who are a little bit on the older scale, uh, that's what we hope for, is that the body goes before the mind. Right, yes, I, I think so. And my grandmother, she's like amazing. She's a, she, in Vietnamese, it's, uh, she sings poetry. So when you do poetry in Vietnamese, you don't just recite it, you sing it. So she actually had a career doing that. And she oh, was, wow. I wanna say it, cause I'm so proud of her. Ah. So the last king in Vietnam, the last emperor, his name was uh, Vua Bao Dai died in exile in France and she was invited to be at his funeral to recite or sing these Whoa. these poems yeah she's Whoa, quite that famous is so cool. <laughs> yeah wow so i think the artistic thing i, I got from her <laughs> well obviously the famous thing you got from her too oh I mean, goodness no since i'm not so well known oh my grandmother my grandmother is like so well known <laughs> oh that's great and is she still basically honored and revered there. Yep, and you know what makes me really sad? So she has these cassette tapes, right? And she, the recordings of her, and she, okay, so a little bit self-centered like all of us artists, she plays the cassette over and over <laughs> to hear herself, because she's kind of deaf now. She hears over, so now when I want to listen, I can't because it's so loose now. You know how this this band or whatever becomes really loose through time? So hopefully, you know, when I go to see her this time, I'm gonna take all of those tapes and then come back and digitalize uh, them or do something so that we can keep them forever. That's wonderful. Yep. Uh, okay, at the end of uh, uh, the show, we always do a little bit of trivia, uh, <laughs> but don't stress because it's not going to be a question that okay. you have to answer. <laughs> all right. So let me give you guys a couple of trivia, uh, trivia facts. Uh, John Milton, of course, is known for Paradise Lost. He used 8,000 different words. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, it's, can you even conceive of it? No, I used about 100, you know, and, and 99 of them were like stuff, yeah. <laughs> the word stuff. I, I, don't, I don't think I know more than a few hundred. You're right? Yeah. Uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland was banned in China because the book implies that animals can talk and write like a human. Wow. The governor of Hanan, China, called it 
disastrous. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know if it's changed. I didn't look to see if, if, any, wow. if, if it's now allowed or right? not. Um, Roald Dahl, the author of many books, but probably the most famous being Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, tested chocolates for Cadbury's <laughs> while in school. <laughs> I love this stuff. This is good. Stieg Larsson wrote the, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and, and, and a number of sequels. He based it on the, the children's um, character Pippi Longstocking. Ah. And he projected her as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, she becomes the girl with a tattoo. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I mean, Pippi Longstocking. I don't think she was the girl with the dragon tattoo. <laughs> but if it says it, then it must be true. And the only other thing is, Marcel Pru, uh, his book "Remembers of Things Past," is the longest book in the world, with nine million six hundred ninety thousand characters. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Uh, more useless trivia. No, this is but, very useful. It's, it's, I love it's just it. fun. It's yes. fun stuff. I'm going to look up the, the Lewis Carroll yeah. China band. Yeah, thing. see if it's still yeah. on. Yeah, I need to do that too. <laughs> uh, okay, well, this has been delightful. I mean, um, and some of it has been less than delightful. Uh, some of the things are hard to, to listen to, you know, to hear. Uh, but But we appreciate you being on. Uh, being so open with with all of us and and uh, I know that when when this gets aired that people are gonna really take to it so thank you for that thank you so much for having me and it's been really wonderful knowing you from four years ago how many years six years ago? I can't remember four 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 plus four plus <laughs> to today because I think the person I was four years ago would not be able to express everything that you and the audience heard today great yeah Good. I'm glad that you, that you found a place to do that, so that our our listeners can and viewers now can actually uh, hear and see it. Uh, you can find uh, Trammy's interview along with all the others by going on Lloyd dot show, um, and that'll give you an opportunity to go to different sites. We're on Spotify and YouTube, uh, and um, we hope that uh, you guys will come take a look or at least a listen because you're going to be fascinated by what Trammy had to say. So again, thank you. Thank you to KCAT always uh, for giving us the, uh, the platform and see you all next time. You just heard Lit with Lloyd here on KCAT Radio. Explore all our KCAT original programming at kcat.org radio.